This next series is about museums, specifically art museums, so museums that are featuring visual art. And this series is called Behind the Scenes at the Museum, Histories, Collections, and Controversies. So museums have become a relatively controversial space due to the idea that a lot of museums might have collections that are being requested back from a home country, or perhaps a museum received a, kind of an inappropriate donation or an inappropriate gift at some point. Um, so museums are now grappling with a lot of really important questions these days in terms of what to collect, how to display, what's the appropriate way to collect, uh, and what is appropriate to return perhaps to a home country. So thinking about some of those questions, we'll think about some encyclopedic museums and then move into modern museums. So on the screen, you see a more historical museum on the upper left, and then moving to more modern contemporary museums uh, on this in the center and on the right. So to cover for today, we're going to talk about an overview of museum architecture and current construction trends. Then we'll move into different types of museums that one might encounter, different type of art museums. Obviously, there are other types of museums as well, like natural history museums or science museums, um, but we'll be focusing in on art museums. And so there's also important questions to ask, ask of museums, and we'll jump into more of these current controversies and then do an overview of this series about museums and then get into the history of the Louvre Museum, which is the most visited museum in the world. So what about this museum makes it so interesting to people? Why does why do people want to go? Uh, we'll talk about the building, public engagement, crowd management, conservation, how it builds up the art historical canon and uh, new campuses that the, the Louvre is exploring. So we'll get into that. Just starting off, I wanted to show a museum that recently opened. This is the Orange County Museum of Art. And you can see a lot of the current trends in museum construction in this particular building. Um, you see an interest in kind of curved lines, uh, may, almost making it this kind of biomorphic form that seems to turn and twist before your very eyes. This idea of bridges that extend across a museum. So you're maybe getting glimpses of the collection or glimpses of the people that are visiting from different views, different elevations. This is something you also see at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, this idea of a bridge, and then you're kind of seeing people from up above. So it did recently open. This is how it looks in real life, a real photograph. So you see those transparent bridges where individuals are going across. You see the um, the light that's entering in. So light has become a real priority in museums. This idea of going into a museum and being kind of closed off from the outside, not having any windows, that is something that museums are moving away from. Um, but of course, with light comes the issue of damage to artwork. So museums always have to balance that out. The idea of allowing natural light in, but making sure that they're not damaging the artworks. That's very, very important. So here are just some views of a kind of architectural um, renderings before it was finished and also the museum under construction. Uh, you can also see the large Richard Serra connector sculpture from 2006. It's 66 feet tall, so very substantial. Um, and it's in this arts center in Costa Mesa, California. Uh, here is again another architectural rendering, and it has this large staircase that has become an important part of the structure. And so it's described as defined by an open and engaging urban presence. Akma's new home will build on the museum's history of community enrichment and presentation of thought-provoking works of art across a wide range of mediums by artists of diverse backgrounds. So it talks about um, the goals of the museum, and then also the stairs. The stair will become an inviting gathering space for pedestrians and visitors, much like the Metropolitan Museum of Art steps in New York City or the Spanish steps in Rome. So just to compare those images. Uh, at the top, you see Akma's staircase in that architectural rendering, and then you see the Metropolitan Museum of Art staircase. The Met Museum is just on the east side of Central Park, and then the Spanish Steps in Rome. And in these cases, these have become real community gathering spaces, spaces where people meet up with other people, and obviously they're big tourist attractions. This is where people go to take photographs. Um, so it remains to be seen kind of what happens with Akma's staircase, because it is a less kind of pedestrian-friendly area. I, I don't think it will have the same crowds, but it's interesting that they're using it 
for this inspir or they're using these sites as inspiration, the Spanish Steps in Rome and the Met Museum in New York. If we see the stairs as they're used today, you can see um, that you know, there are a little, there's fewer people there, but as the museum becomes more popular, I'm sure these stairs will start to fill up and become a more comfortable place for uh, individuals to come and rest and enjoy the California sunshine. Uh, here's just a few other architecture or renderings of the interior of Akma. Um, and then a, a final rendering, seeing the outside, you see that Richard Serra connector sculpture. And I think what also really stands out to me is how important architecture has become at museums for photography reasons. People want to record their visits to museums, they're posting them to social media. And so museums have really started thinking about how are we going to look when people come, when, we, when we're photographed, um, and the building itself becomes really an attraction as well. And so in this rendering, you see someone taking a photograph. So this idea that they are very aware of the fact that this building is going to be photographed. Of course, the idea that a museum is an important um, attraction, the building itself is not that new. If we think about Frank Lloyd Wright's design for the Guggenheim Museum in the 1950s, this was something that was very controversial on the Upper East Side of New York. Um, some people called it a garage because it looked kind of like you, something you would drive up with your car, um, but very, very different from the more traditional architecture that was more in kind of European inspiration, this kind of pre-war architecture that you could often find find in on the Upper East Side. Um, so this would have been a really striking change and something that would have grabbed people's attention and gotten them interested in coming to see the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum. Um, and then the Guggenheim has really become known as this museum of unique architectural constructions. Of course, Bill Bow, this museum that um, really catapulted Frank Gehry to become an even more famous architect. He's um, also been commissioned to create similar structures with this same kind of exterior. Um, for example, the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. But if we look at the museum in Bilbao, this was something that really drove people to this particular city. And it's been called the Bilbao effect, this idea that uh, having a cultural institution with this striking structure, with this important collection and important exhibitions can really bring people and bring tourists to cities that they might not have gone to. Um, so this was a very, very important architectural project. And you can also see there's a Louise Bourgeois, a spider in the foreground here. Um, but this, and also as you walk through the city, you get kind of these peaks of the museum. Um, I haven't been to this city, but I've seen photographs where you just kind of see it peeking through the other buildings and it really draws you there. So this idea of how do you attract people to your museum, use the architecture as a way to draw people to your museum. Um, another example of a museum under construction and really being transformed is the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, so LACMA, and the opening is planned for 2024. At least that's what it was a few months ago, so maybe it's been updated. Um, but it's this new structure that's going to span Wilshire Boulevard, so there'll actually be a street running underneath it, a main street in Los Angeles, and you'll be able to see people in the galleries up above. You'll see that same kind of curving architectural form that has become so popular, and also the idea that all the galleries are going to be on one floor for the most part. So there's this idea of equality among the art collection. You know, something's not going to be above something else. Often we'll have paintings on an upper floor and then sculpture or larger decorative arts uh, on a lower floor just for logistical reasons. Um, but this idea of putting all cultures on a single floor and presenting them as something that are in, they are in dialogue with each other, you can compare them, um, and really moving away from the more kind of strict hierarchical or geographical exhibition that you might see at other museums. So as you can see, this is some of the construction photographs as well as a photograph on the lower right where you can see how the the original building looked, and then it kind of became a mishmash of different architectural styles. And so they're really scrapping most of the the main buildings. Um, however, they are keeping the pavilion for Japanese art, which you can see in the background on the left. And then they also have uh, some other structures that were built more recently that they are keeping. 
So some other renderings, this, so it would be called the David Geffen Galleries. You can see how it's all displayed on this single level. One of the controversies of this structure is that it's actually reducing the amount of gallery space. At least that's what's been reported. And so they, that's a concern for some individuals that the idea of more would be better. They want to see more of the collection. Um, but perhaps there's an idea of kind of rotating these works through. Here's another architectural rendering. Um, so you get that sense of everything being presented together and that you really can move from one culture to the next and you can have these nice moments of comparison and that you have sculpture and painting all together. Um, this is the Broad Contemporary Art Museum, which is or the BCAM, which is part of the LACMA campus. This structure will be staying. It is multi-level and uh, it does tend to feature a little bit more of the, the modern collection. That's what we tend to find here. Uh, and initially it was created probably with the idea that, that the LA County Museum thought that Broad, Eli Broad, would, would donate his collection to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art or a good percentage of it. Um, but he actually ended up opening his own museum and he, he has another museum as well, um, in Michigan. But this is the, the Broad, called the Broad, in, um, in downtown Los Angeles. So there's also, there's a Broad Contemporary Art Museum or BCAM at LACMA, but then there's also The Broad, uh, which is in downtown Los Angeles. And so some people say it looks like a cheese grater, but this is another example of a very unique work of architecture. So here you have this kind of oculus that um, allows light to come in. There's a space for gathering where the oculus is, and then you enter in on this on a corner, and then there's kind of this tunnel that leads you up to the main galleries, which are on the upper level, and you have this nice um, kind of filtered light that's coming in, because again, you don't want the light to damage the artwork. All right, so let's go through a couple of types of art museums. So you have encyclopedic art museums. This is the idea of trying to cover lots of cultures, lots of time periods. These museums tend to be a bit more controversial because they are really drawing a lot of culture from a lot of different, um, a lot of different places and a lot of times those cultures sometimes want them back. Um, encyclopedic museums are sometimes the result of kind of colonial histories, the idea of cultures going in and taking artworks often without permission or with perhaps inappropriate permission, like permission that maybe would be judged as questionable today. So it's just important to keep in mind um, how did these museums get their collections and how do the museums talk about how they got their collections in order to create a very clear history of that. And then we have um, modern and contemporary museums of art. So the idea of what's been produced in the 20th and 21st centuries, what are some key works that we should be paying attention to. There also can be specific regional and artistic um, focuses for or foci for these different museums. The idea that maybe you just focus on a certain artist or you just focus on West Africa, or you just focus on Western Europe. So the idea of picking a different region and really delving into that. And then individual collectors. We often see this where individuals might spend their lives or the latter part of their lives, once they've earned a lot of money perhaps, um, making outstanding artistic collections and then deciding that they want to create their own museum and have a space where the public can come and see it. And then also it's a great way for those individuals to be remembered for this idea that they're really giving back and that they're sharing their collection with the public. Um, so a couple other just art museums to, to show the unique architectural designs that are developing. We have um, the de Young Museum in San Francisco from 2005, which what which is in Golden Gate Park and is faced with um, copper. And so you have this really interesting patina that has developed and it really seems to kind of grow out of Golden Gate Park. It, ha it, it is, uh, it's really nicely connected to its um, surroundings. And also it's right next door to the Japanese tea garden. So you have a very beautiful garden nearby. Um, but it is a, it is a really interesting structure. You can also go up to the observatory deck. So if you enter in, I think on this side, you can head up there and get a really beautiful view of the garden. Another new construction from 2016 is a Sonetta expansion at SF MoMA. So SF MoMA had a really lovely building, but they really had outgrown their space. But obviously they're in a dense urban environment, so they needed to create this rather tall 
um, slender construction, but again, allowing a lot of light to come in, especially in the hallways. There's some vertical gardens and cafe spaces. So some spaces for kind of urban refreshment, which is really nice. Um, and then I just think this museum is really interesting, the Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida. I mean, it's so clearly connected to the main artists that they, that they collect. Um, and so just the building itself, you're not going to, you're not going to be confused whose art is displayed here because it's so clearly Salvador Dali. You have this kind of melting bench with the clock, uh, and then you have these kind of surrealist glass domes. So really interesting how they're connecting to the artist himself. So what's the purpose of a museum? So protect and conserve, research and display the collection. There's learning and knowledge. Um, there's a delight in aesthetic pleasures. So this idea of what do you find beautiful? What attracts your eye? What do you find interesting? There are intellectual and aesthetic challenges. So perhaps you've been to a museum and said, I don't like that, or I think that's really ugly, or I could do that, or you know, something where you have a problem <laughs> with what you saw. But I think that's interesting too. I always say, if everyone likes a work of art, it must not be a very, very good work of art because every work of art, I think you have people who like the work of art and other people who don't. So I think it's interesting to, to have some challenges when you're looking at art. It can be a place of refuge and contemplation. So some people think art museums are very boring, but for me, I like to go to them. And for me, it's very refreshing. I like to see what creative outputs people, you know, what people have created, what they're thinking about, what new ideas they're coming up with. Um, and just sitting on a bench in a relatively quiet museum, that's a great day for me. Um, and then community engagement. So this idea of bringing people together, Museums can be places of concerts and film screenings and other types of, um, you know, lectures, gallery lectures. So this idea of who's in your city or town and bringing them all together within an artistic space to share in this creative endeavor. Um, so there is a, a book that I wanted to quote from, Museums Matter from 2011. This was written by James Cuno, who was the director of the Art Institute of Chicago, a very large encyclopedic museum, the main encyclopedic museum of Chicago. Um, and then he went on to become the CEO of the Getty Trust. And so he asks in his book, why do people come to museums like the Art Institute of Chicago in such great numbers? It is, I hold, because they hunger to have their world enlarged, their life enriched by the experience of new and strange, wonderful things and sense of, and sense of made, and sense made of the differences they confront in the polyglot multi-ethnic world in which they live. I'm going to correct that. Sense made of the differences they confront in the So it's very important because he is the director of a museum and he's speaking to the value he thinks his museum is conveying to the public, which I think is, he's right in that sense, but there's also a lot of controversies again that go along with these encyclopedic museums in terms of how they collect, what they collect, what they exclude, those kinds of questions. So I'm not saying that the museum is right or wrong. It's just, it's important to ask these questions just to make sure we're getting a, you know, a clear picture of what museums are doing. So questions to ask of museums, what should they collect? How should they display? What stories should they tell? Um, which cultures are they highlighting and which ones are they neglecting? There's also the idea of provenance and authenticity. So the provenance is the history of collection or provenience. Um, who has collected it? Where did it come from? Where was it purchased? And then the idea of authenticity. Is everything we're seeing at a museum authentic? Is it a real work of art from the time period the museum says it's from? Or could it be a forgery? And what's interesting is that museums are usually really careful about what they're putting on. They want to be careful about researching the provenance. But at the same time, you know, museums might be hesitant to find out also if something's a forgery, if they really want it to be authentic. So I think in general, museums will ask those important questions. But of course, that's an uncomfortable question to ask, like what's real and what's fake? Um, how does the architecture support or distract from the viewing experience of the artwork? So some people have said since there have become, there has become this trend of very, very, uh, kind of outrageous or 
unique structures for museums that are these structures now distracting people from the artwork itself. So that's just something to consider when you go to a museum, are you more interested in the architecture or are you more interested in the art inside the building? And maybe both are interesting to you, but it's just a question to consider. How do museums function as community spaces? How do they reflect and engage the local communities? And then how do they link to wider global dialogues? So thinking about museums, are they more for the local community? Are they more for um, kind of tourists coming from all over the globe? Or is it both, hopefully? Um, but what is your museum doing in terms of engaging those different groups? And then this idea of concerns of an encyclopedic museum, this idea of collecting broadly versus a modern contemporary museum, where perhaps you're looking for the new, most unique thing that um, a contemporary artist is doing. Obviously, you're going to have different media in a modern and contemporary art museum. So you might have things like plastics or, you know, acrylic versus more natural materials that you might run into in an encyclopedic museum. There have been a lot of books written lately. I mean, there have always been books written about some of the controversies of museums. So for example, um, over a decade ago now, there was a book about the collecting practices of the Getty, especially these looted antiquities that seem to have been linked to their collection. More recently, Dan's, Dan Hicks has published The Brutish Museums about the Benin Bronzes, so that you have this documented sacking of the palace and the taking of these bronzes. And so this idea that we can clearly see that these bronzes were looted um, that are now in a lot of collections in the United States and in Europe and in England. And so this idea of how do we get those back to the correct owners when we know for sure that there was this looting or sacking and probably you know inappropriate taking of these artworks. And then also the issue, there's a big issue in terms of the Holocaust and the taking of artworks from Jewish individuals um, who maybe were forced to sell their artwork or forced to give away their artwork uh, when they were fleeing from Europe during the time of Nazis and during the time of the concentration camps. And so how do we get these artworks back to the rightful owner? A very famous story is the Lady of Gold, so Gustav Klimt's portrait of Adele Block Bauer and um, how it eventually returned to the family that, that owned it and um, now is in a museum collection. Uh, so recently from 2021, Benin pushes for full restitution as 26 looted objects destined to return to the country go on show at the Quai Bernley Museum in Paris. So this idea of trying to get more of these bronzes back to the home country. All right, so in terms of what's covered in this series, you have the history of the early museum in the Louvre, and then we move into the British Museum and Met Museum and other encyclopedic museums in the United States. Then we have individual collectors, such as Guggenheim, Frick, Morgan, Manil, and Broad, and the Lucas Museum, and then the modern contemporary art museums, controversies, issues of looting, fakes, forgeries, sorry, it's raining, <laughs> um, deaccessioning of art, exhibition design and museum architecture, decolonize the museum is the last lecture, so questioning the canon, restitution, and satellite campuses. So giving a history of early museums, um, just this idea of what are kind of some of the early painting galleries that we would see. So obviously tombs were a space for painting. We see this in Egypt as well as in Etruscan tombs. This would have been for the upper classes. It would have been very expensive to do this. But just this desire to kind of decorate one space, not just with one image, but really do a full program of decoration. Um, so this is something we see really early on. There's also an interesting story or kind of history of the Acropolis in Athens that there may have been a pinacotheque or a painting gallery uh, just to the left when you were entering into the Propylaea, when you're entering into the gateway. So to the left, uh, you could see that behind these Doric columns, there's this window and doorway into this pinacotheque. So there may have been this kind of painting gallery um, on the Acropolis, although it may have been added later. We're not 100% sure. In Rome, there were always these kind of programs of architecture. Here we're seeing the form of Trajan, which now uh, most of it has been, the materials have been removed, although we still do have the column of Trajan. But this idea of recounting histories and stories and glorifying emperors, um, this was very much part of Roman visual culture, ancient Roman visual culture. 
Roman houses of the upper classes, that kind of top 1%. This was also a space where you would want to decorate and fill a space with a lot of art painting, paint directly on the walls. These are some of the reconstructions um, from the Roman Villa Voplantis, which is in the Bay of Naples. Also in other areas besides just Europe, you could, in North Africa with Egypt, um, we could also see this in Japan. So in kind of early modern Japan, you would see this tradition of uh, golden screens that were highly decorated, vividly painted. The idea that gold would illuminate these dark palaces, which were heavily fortified. And so um, this gold would create a beautiful illumination, but also you would have these very natural views that are reminiscent of the kind of painting you would see in East Asian cultures, um, but really brightening up these, di these darker spaces. We can also see this in an illustration from the Tale of Genji, um, the, uh, and the, this also helped to kind of move along the narrative itself of the Tale of Genji, but the idea of representing the natural world throughout one's palace through screens. Um, so let's jump into some early museums, and these were sometimes called studioli or studiolos. Um, the idea of rulers in Renaissance Italy would sometimes have a relatively small room that was kind of like a cabinet of wonders for them. They would have these cabinets that could open up and they could store beautiful objects inside of them. And so you just have this idea of coming into a space that could be a space where they could study, where they could read, um, but also they could perhaps bring one or two friends in and share a valuable object if they opened up some of these cabinet doors. This is a beautiful intarsia, so you have this wood inlay to create an illusion of perspective and dimension. Here are just some more views. Um, this studiolo from Gubbio uh, was reconstructed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, so you can see it there. Um, here's the Ducal Palace in Gubbio today, but obviously the studiolo has been removed. Um, that same ruler, so his name, I'll go back to him, Federico de Montefeltro, who was the Duke of Urbino in the 15th century. Um, he also had another studiolo in Urbino, in his major palace in Urbino. Uh, we also have Francesco I de Medici from the 16th century. He also had a kind of a closet or a studiolo. Um, this is inside the Palazzo Vecchio, so the, the city hall of Florence. Um, and in a letter to Vasari, it's discussed how this closet had things rare and precious, both in terms of their value and artistic merit, that is to say jewels, medallions, precious stones, cut glass, crystal vases, mechanical devices, and other objects not too big, placed in their own cupboards and divided according to category. Um, we see Francesco I de Medici here, and he was very interested in experiments and the natural elements. So on these different walls, he um, had different objects from his collection, but they were also organized according to element. Um, so you could, again, open these cupboards, and if you visit this today, if you go on a special tour, they can open them and you can see those little cupboards. But you had a wall dedicated to fire, water, air, and earth. And so each of those kind of helped to organize the collection. Um, and again, this is inside the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. As we move on, we start to see what are called Kunstkammers or Wunderkammers, these rooms that are filled with art, Kunst or Wunder, like this kind of cabinet of wonders. Um, and this tends to take on a combination of visual art as well as science or an interest in the natural world. So here we see this kind of layering of shells and fish and natural material fossils and also painting and sculpture and um, porcelain or ceramic. And so all of this could be combined together in these kind of mini museums that were owned by wealthy individuals. Here we see another idea of kind of an early museum where we're combining the idea of beautiful man-made objects, but mostly an interest, an interest in science and natural materials. So you can see on the ceiling, you have an alligator, no, probably crocodile. Crocodile, uh, you have again, different types of fish and um, interest in the natural world. Another example, um, again, you can see a real focus on the natural world here. And a lot of museums have tried to recreate these types of Kunstkammers or Wunderkammers by placing lots of objects together, painting, ceramic, uh, natural materials, shells, and they'll tuck them into these little desks and cabinets to give you a sense of what it might have been like for someone who was collecting. 
Um, here you can see this is a uh, celestial globe with clockwork, which was made for the Kunstkammer of Rudolf II Habsburg, who was the king of Hungary and Bohemia. Um, and you, oh, Bohemia. And then you can see his Kunstkammer also included small bronzes, small cut stones, medallions, ivories, books, coins, scientific instruments, natural objects, and drawings. Here are some other examples and more different art cabinets. This idea you could open them up and find lots of different treasures inside. Also a trend in museums recently is just open storage. The idea that there could be areas of the museum where lots of art objects are collected. So in New York, Met, in New York's Met Museum, um, they have a center that is packed with over 7,000 objects. And so it just gives you a sense of how much these museums often have. There's also visible storage at the Brooklyn Museum. And you can get little peaks of the storage at the Broad Museum. So the Broad, with over 21,000 square feet of collection storage space, the vault was conceived as the heart of the museum, and it allows the Broad to store or exhibit 99% of its nearly 2,000 objects on site, um, where it's all surprisingly accessible to the staff, and that's a game changer for the museum, so it can help them plan exhibits and lend works as well. <clears throat> So let's jump into some of these early encyclopedic museums. So in the next museum, we'll talk about the British Museum, which first opened in 1759 to all studious and curious persons, although it really was mostly the upper class that would and the educated class that would go and see it. Um, and so we'll talk about that in the next lecture. What I want to focus on for the rest of the lecture is the Louvre Museum, which is the most visited museum in the world. And so millions and millions of people go to see the Louvre and primarily to see the Mona Lisa, to see the Venus de Milo and the Winged Victory, and then they usually kind of head out. Um, but it is a massive collection. It's the museum that I always get lost in. And it's, it's an outstanding museum and it does have some very unique elements. So first off, it is a, it's originally a palace and it was built in multiple stages. So you kind of have this disjointed aspect to it. A lot of museums in Europe were originally palaces. So you have this issue of these are buildings that were not intended to host millions and millions of people. Sure, they were designed to host a lot of people, but not as many people as go to them now. So often you'll find like bathrooms tucked in weird places and um, things that don't quite fit together. And you see that in museums today as well if they were built over multiple stages, but this is a, a historic building. And so you're gonna run into some challenges. Uh, and obviously there was the construction of the pyramid in the middle here, and this was very controversial. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, here you can see the palace itself as it survives. Originally there was a section that cut through here as well, um, but that eventually was damaged. And so now it's really this large U-shape, I guess. Um, why is it called a Lou the Louvre? So there's different ideas, but some people think it's connect connected to the word con about a wolf den. Um, so that's a possibility, or it, it could be something else. We're not 100% sure, but it doesn't, there's not a direct French translation, so you don't need to worry about it. <laughs> Here's an aerial view where you get a sense of that kind of U shape, although you can get the sense of how it's built on, and then you have the square court over here. This image is just to give you a sense of the crowd. So in 2018, they had over 10 million visitors. You can see the crowds here trying to take photographs of the Mona Lisa, especially with social media. Uh, it's only become more and more of a problem, this idea of how to control the crowds. So the, <laughs> so I am paid designed the, uh, the pyramid, and this was very different in terms of architectural style when you compare it to the palace itself, even though the palace is many different architectural styles combined. And so the newspaper Le Figaro uh, condemned the pyramid as a gadget, a book written by three unnamed scholars scathingly denounced the grand trickery of the Grand Louvre referring to Mitterrand's expansion scheme for the museum. Um, Pei has said he has never been so violently attacked when he presented the project to France's National Commission of Historical Monuments. Gabri, uh, Gabri remembers his interpreter avoided translating some of the comments before bursting into tears, but Pei certainly understood it's not Dallas here. Uh, La Meteor d'Art Museum or magazine wondered why Mitterrand had to choose a Japanese American architect when a French one would have never 
would never have cut the perspective towards the west of Paris. Le Monde critic André Fermegé blasted this foreign body showing such disregard for history and he quit the newspaper when it published a special supplement devoted to the Planned Pyramid. Um, so just some quotes from this article to show you how controversial this was. So the idea that the architect was foreign, the idea that they thought he was disrespecting the history of the Louvre, um, but also there was probably some kind of racism here, the idea that he was an outsider. Um, and it was a really striking change, but it's become very beloved. So it's a great example of when something seems really strange when it's first created, eventually it can be accepted and appreciated. So there you can see that contrast with the pyramid, which is now the main entrance, and then you can um, contrast it to the more historical structure. Although the way I always enter the Louvre is usually from the side. I go through the mall area. There's a little mall. Well, it's a big mall actually. And then there's a side entrance. So that's usually where I go. I avoid the pyramid. So that's just a tip. I don't know if that's still good post pandemic, but I hope it helps you. Um, a couple of views of the Louvre over time, how it developed from this medieval castle to a more Renaissance style, early modern palace with uh, Renaissance and neoclassical elements. One of my favorite parts of the Louvre is seeing this, these parts of the older castle, this kind of fortress like towers and structures. And so I love to go through the mall in the mall section. You can see it. And then also in the, in the museum itself. So be sure to seek this out when you go to the Louvre. Of course, with the French Revolution and the expulsion of the monarchy, this palace was no longer used by the royal family and could be used by the people. And so really the collection became that of the people. And so here you see the Grand Galerie in the 1790s. Um, and you can see that it's now being inhabited or visited by the public, that they're coming to see the royal collection of artwork. And so we have a couple of views here of the Grand Galerie. This is the marriage of Napoleon I, so kind of a return of more of a royal, well, in this case, imperial individual um, in the early 19th century. So the Louvre really becomes a space for others. We've even seen Beyonce and Jay-Z create um, a recent music video uh, in this space. So again, it's inhabited by, by lots of people and for lots of different purposes. And obviously it's gone from the royalty of France to like the royalty of music in America, which is amazing. Um, different rooms where artists could come and sketch. We often see images of women sketching. And so women artists are something we, we often have to study and seek out. So it's great to see them working hard and kind of putting this all together. Um, so this is the room of the seasons again, and just a couple of different views, artistic views. And then here we're in the grand gallery. Again, you can see it really being filled up with just kind of your Parisian, maybe middle, upper middle class coming to see the wonderful artwork of the Renaissance in this particular case. Um, here we're seeing women painting um, a Botticelli. And so this is the Botticelli itself and then the women painting it. Here's another famous paint. This one's from in the Met, but it's a woman who's drawing in the Louvre. And you can see there's this broken window here. It's a very striking painting with this dramatic play of light and dark. Um, so the Louvre really became a spot for artistic training. Artists would go and, and paint there and draw there. And it was a place for, for learning. In the gallery of Apollo, you still see this history of the royal family because you do see some of those royal collections in terms of jewelry and hard stone vessels, some of the luxury wares that were collected and owned by the royal family. So for example, we have the crown or they have the crown of Louis the 15th and a few remaining French crown jewels. So those are still visible. And some of the collections of royal hardstone or hardstone vessels that were owned by the royals, these were very popular, um, especially in the Renaissance to, and late Renaissance to be collected by uh, royal families. There's also a school connected to the Louvre so individuals can learn uh, in this you know, with this amazing collection. The big issue, however, are these works of art that are the main attraction, most importantly, the Mona Lisa. So a lot of people come and now they're really trying to regulate the crowds much more carefully. They have covered the Mona Lisa. It was stolen in the early 20th century. So it of course has very tight security. Um, but they've really changed the display. They've really tried to protect it. They've really tried to um, keep the crowds at bay and make sure that 
only a certain number of people are coming through at any given time. Um, there is a, a saying, this idea of you see the Mona Lisa, the Venus de Milo, and the Nike of Salmon Thrace, and then you're out of there. Um, but I really recommend take your time in the Louvre, find a culture that you're interested in, and try to visit that. Um, there's a lot of really tucked away galleries, so to take your time and enjoy that, you can easily be in a gallery all on your own in the Louvre Museum. So uh, definitely try to make that effort to, to find those, those galleries. There have been a lot of concerns that the Louvre, while it is more of an encyclopedic museum with a broad collection, that it does neglect cultures that are outside of Europe or um, and also Egypt. They have a very strong Egyptian collection and Near Eastern collection. But other than that, a lot of those other uh, a lot of other cultures are neglected. Um, so in two thousand nine, there is there are the galleries devoted to arts of Africa, Oceania, Asia, and the Americas. Um, but some people responded it was kind of too little, too late. But it is important to note that they are making an effort to make it a bit more encyclopedic. Of course, this is a collection that was primarily the royal collection and it reflects a lot of Italian Renaissance and a lot of French art and then some of the art that was the result of colonial influences in North Africa and also in the Middle East. So that's where a lot of the collections are coming from. And so these collections from other parts of Africa and from Asia, there just really wasn't that representation, but the Louvre is trying to include that or include it more. Um, here's just another image of those crowds. And so due to these crowds, there's a push to have other campuses of the Louvre. So one of those is the Louvre Lens. And so this is 200 kilometers north of Paris, and they're really seeking what's called that Bill Bow effect, the idea of drawing people to a city and um, bringing more commercial activity to places that are outside of Paris. And also the Louvre collection is so massive, it's important to share that collection with others. And then here we can see that, that I'm just giving you that idea of the Bill Bow effect because this is Bill Bow, um, but this is you know one of the goals there. There's also a Louvre Abu Dhabi, so the idea that this opened in 2017, um, with the idea also of creating a partnership in a different region outside of France. And there will also be a Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, which is scheduled for completion in a few years. And you can see again this kind of really unique architectural style that's developing. All right, in the next lecture, I'll be talking about more encyclopedic museums like the British Museum, the Met Museum, and that proliferation of encyclopedic museums throughout the United States and that distinct style that we often see. So thanks for watching and I'd appreciate any comments.